Good to see you all this morning. The message is, does, can Christianity teach us anything unique about racism? Or do we just have the answers the rest of the world gives us? And the answer should be yes, shouldn't it? I mean, do you want a faith that just looks like the rest of the world? Now, there are questions in which we're just like the rest of the world, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not Christian. I mean, that's the same. But on a moral issue of racism, shouldn't we be saying what everyone else is saying? Because what they're saying is working so well that, you know, we should be just be doing what they're doing, right? Or do we want to have something unique? And I argue we should have something unique. I am a Christian. I'm a sociologist. I believe in God. I believe in science. I think good theology and good science goes together. And when it doesn't, you either have bad theology, and we've seen plenty of that, or you have bad science, and we've seen plenty of that as well. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, how Christianity and science goes together, and I'm going to bring in some sociological research to back up my point, because I don't think that I have to run away from the science on this. What God wants us is verifiable out in the larger community, and the answer is, are we willing to do it or not? So let's get started. First, we live in a racialized society. And this is a society where race matters profoundly. I'm going to skip a little bit faster because I was told that, you know, at, at, at 11.35, there's the ejector button and I'm gone. So I'm going to make sure I get through all this. Basically, race matters. The fact that I'm an African American impacts my life. The fact that some of you all are European Americans impacts your life. It matters in our society. Sometimes it matters for the good. If I come onto the basketball court, they say, hey, this guy can play, he's black. You know, so sometimes it matters for the good. Sometimes it does not matter for the good. Race matters in our society. So what do we have to look at that? Well, because it matters in such ways that we see these racial divisions. We see these problems that emerge in our society, and thus we have the racial hostility. Thus, we have racial alienation. Racial alienation. And while a lot of things have changed for the good over the past decades, you know, there's, there's more freedoms than we have. That alienation still is there. And we're alienated from each other. Here's the reason why we're alienated from each other. There are contrasting views about racism. One view is that racism is something that one person does to another is overt. So if I don't like you because of your race, that's racism. People with this view say that the way we deal with racism is we ignore race, a colorblindness perspective. We ignore race, and then everything is good. Another perspective is racism is structural as well as individualistic. And social institutions can perpetuate racism. So we must be very proactive in dealing with the racism. We, we can't just lie back and hope things go well. We must be aggressive in dealing with the racism. Now, today, a lot of people are calling this anti-racism. And you all have probably heard this term, anti-racism. It's, it's a very popular term. became very prominent a couple of years ago in the 2020s during the George Floyd riots or, or protests and, and, and what have you. And people talk about anti-racism. The two big selling books at the time was How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kendi and White Fragility by D'Angelo. So it, it became all the rage. It's been called other things in other points in time, but anti-racism works just fine. What happens is these contrasting views becomes a source of our contention because they have different answers on how we deal with racism. Do we ignore it, colorblindness, or do we take a proactive approach? So, let's look at this one at a time. First, is colorblindness viable? I put up here several studies, because colorblindness says we ignore racism, race goes away, or racism goes away. That is true only if we don't have continuing problems, because if you ignore race, and we still have these problems, then it's like ignoring a wound. You don't ignore a wound and hope it goes away, you treat it. So let's look at some of these studies. The first one, there's no real decrease in racial discrimination over the past 25 years. 
And we know this because of what we call audit studies. Now, an audit study is when you take a black or a Hispanic and a white, and they both apply for a job. And then we look at the outcome. And what we find out, over 25 years, this has not decreased, that the white person is called back for the job more often than the black or Hispanic person. Now, it's not the fact that, like 25 years ago, they were called back 20% more, more, and now it's only 10% more. It's not decrease. And this has done a lot of audit studies. It's not just any one study. It's called a meta-analysis. We know that it's not decreased over the past 25 years. So this is not, hey, that was my, my, my parents' racism, but we're doing better. It's not getting better. There is driving while black, that African Americans are more likely to be pulled over while, while driving than European Americans. Uh, this study was done in Ohio, but there's been other studies done in other states. What they do is they look at the race of people driving, how fast they're driving, and blacks don't drive any worse than you whites. That might not be saying much, but you know, it is what it is. And African Americans are pulled over more. Residential segregation still impacts the education of people of color. I went to high school. I actually didn't go to a predominantly black high school. I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school. And so for whatever, you know, there's a long story. It's not that important. But I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school. Our high school was good at one thing. It was not football. You know what we're good at? Industrial arts. We build a home every year. We, we, we swept state industrial arts. You know what we weren't so good at? Academics. When I went to college, I saw a lot of people from the other high schools in my town. Very few people from my own high school, because my, my high school didn't send kids to college. They sent kids to be builders, which is nothing wrong with that, except what are you doing when the Hispanic kids learn how to build stuff and the white kids learn how to go to college? And that's what was happening in my high schools, in the high schools in the town that I lived in. Racism and the beliefs and practices of healthcare uh, providers. Uh, this particular study looked at 37 different studies, and in 26 of them, I believe, they found evidence of racism in how people were prescribed medicine, how they were treated. In other words, colorblindness says, ignore all this, and let's just ignore race. And so what you're essentially telling people of color is, we don't, these problems are here, but we'll just ignore them, and we'll pretend everything's okay. Consequently, that does not work. So we should be very assertive. We should be very aggressive, right? We should engage in anti-racism. Oops. And we're all over the place. Can you go back to the anti-racism slide? Oh, yeah, that one there. Yes, okay. Okay, so anti-racism. You've heard this, what does it mean? And, and people can argue about what it means. And what I did was I, I read all the, all the contemporary literature out there, D'Angelo, Kendi, others. There's, there's five or six other books that were high on the list. And I want to see what they, were, they agreed upon. And there's probably more than this, but here's three very important elements. Anti-racism is very proactive. Anti-racism is we are going to deal with someone with racism. We're not going to sit back and wait for things to happen. We're going to be aggressive. To, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to seek it out and defeat it. We're going to dismantle all aspects of racism. So it's not just the racism of, you know, someone who says a racial epitaph or anything like that. It's not just that. It's, it's structural racism, institutional racism, systematic racism, all aspects of racism. Now, if that was anti-racism, I probably would go, you know what, this is pretty good. You know, be proactive, look for all the elements. It's this third point, though, that's problematic. And this came in book after book after book. The response of whites is to do what people of color want. For example, in D'Angelo, she basically makes the argument that the response of whites is to listen to people of color and try to do better. That becomes problematic because one thing I've discovered is that we humans don't do well getting everything that we want. I'm raising a seven, five, and four-year-old. I get a lesson reinforced every day. Now, what does research say? Does this work or not? Here's what research has said. For example, diversity training. You know, diversity programs you all probably have gone through or will go through. 
has little long-term effect on prejudice. What they find is that when it, it may have a temporary effect. So you go to diversity training, they measure you right afterwards, you have less prejudice. Six months later, that's all gone. It's kind of like when you go off to Bible camp, and you come back home, and you're on fire for the Lord, and you tell your, you know, uh, you know, your mom and dad, you tell, hey, you know, mom and dad, I want to fire for the Lord. I'm going to keep my room clean. I'll, you know, I'm going to be respectful. I'm going to do all that. And six months later, it's, it's back to normal. You know, it's just, mom and dad said, what happened? That's what diversity pro pro programs do. But worse, they can also generate a backlash against people of color. So if you do diversity training poorly, you will get a backlash against people of color. If you do it well, you may not get a backlash. So you don't, you're not getting prejudice reduction, but you could get a backlash. Here's an interesting study. Teaching about privilege, teaching about privilege, actually can create less sympathy for marginalized whites, but does not increase the sympathy for marginalized people of color. So what happens is that uh, people who are already sympathetic to people of color don't grow more sympathetic. People who are not sympathetic don't grow more sympathetic to people of color. But people who are sympathetic to people of color sometimes become less sympathetic to marginalized whites. And the, and the total effect then of teaching about privilege can be that you're less sympathetic to marginalized people. Anti-racism approaches can lead, this is a very interesting study, I don't have time to really go into it, but I'll just put it this way. They looked at companies who incorporate anti-racism techniques about five years later, those companies had fewer people of color as managers. The goal is to have more people of color to be managers. They, they incorporate such things such as mandatory diversity training and, and grievance committees, and five years later, they had fewer people of color as managers. Anti-racism doesn't work. It generates its own backlash. Now, that's the sociologist. The theologian in me says, there's something beyond this happening. And here's why I think Christianity offers us something different. The truth is, both these approaches lack the acknowledgement of something. That's human depravity. You see, in both approaches, what they're saying is, look, do what we say is correct, and we will solve the problem. That is not an appreciation of human depravity. So what do we mean by human depravity? And to me, human depravity is a core key element of our Christian faith. And we can see it in these verses. I'm not even going to go reading them. You can read them for yourself. You can find a lot more. If, if, you, if you lack verses of human depravity, just go to Google, put human depravity, Bible verses, and they'll just come up. Think about it. What does our faith mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? It means you acknowledge that you have fallen short. You acknowledge that you need help, that you're not going to be able to do it on your own. Your depravity is holding you back, and so you need help, and Christ comes in to help you. This is not some sort of peripheral, this is not, you know, should we ordain women, or this is not, you know, should we baptize immersion, or, you know, I don't want to step on any hot, hot potatoes here, but those aren't really core issues. This is a core issue. Christian faith. Here's what human depravity means, though, in a practical sense. We can't trust us humans to find the right answers by ourselves. And what we've been trying to do is solve racial problems with our own abilities. Let me discuss a little bit about what got me to this and recognize this, because I think this has ramifications beyond just racial issues when we think about it. Ramifications as to why we Christians have something to offer the world that people are not seeing. And it's more than just belief in God or, or things of this nature or prosperity, uh, you know, gospel, that sort of stuff. No, there's a core element of truth that I think we need to touch upon. So let me get to this. Human perfectibility versus human depravity. When I was in grad school, I learned about the concept of human perfectibility. That the Enlightenment thinkers believe that as we moved away from religion, we humans would be able to perfect ourselves and our culture in, in meaningful ways. 
that we would not be held, held back by the fatalism of religion, all right? And so the concept of human perfectibility was a prominent one among the Lyman thinkers. Humans become better with education. The belief was that when we have xenophobia, when we have uh, bigotry or, or, or things of this nature, it's because we're not educated. We need to educate people. Humans are rational creatures. They didn't have kids seven, five, and four. A rational creatures can become convinced to be better. Rationality. That your rational, if we just appeal to people's rationality, show them a better way, they'll take it. Humans are at the pinnacle of evolution. We can do this. If our insight, and here's the implication on racial issues, if our insight, be it colorblindness or anti-racism, is adopted, then we will move towards a better world, an end of racial alienation. Both groups, anti-racist and those who are colorblind, are arguing, look, you come adopt our philosophy and we'll issue in utopia. Those of you, I mean, I'm on a college campus. Some of you all have probably studied some of Marxism. Marxism is a version of this, is it not? That, you know, that if we can lift up false consciousness, if we can uh, you know, educate people correctly, we'll create this economic utopia which will lead to a social utopia. It's not that much different from what's happening with those advocating colorblindness and anti-racism. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I see that with anti-racism. I mean, they're, they're telling us, you know, you must be anti-racist and Black Lives Matter and all this sort of stuff. But I don't see this color blindness. We just want to leave you left alone. Well, it's tempting to think that, but that's not the reality. And that was dri driven home to me a couple of years ago when I was looking for, for knowledge. So I went to that bastion of wisdom, Facebook. And, I, you know, raising my boys, I was like, you know, uh, I just had a question out there on, on uh, how do you deal with talking to them about, you know, about uh, dealing with, 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 with racial co issues that are kind of come up and, and how you're going, you know, uh, you know, what we call the talk, you know, how's it, how do you engage in the talk? And, and so I just post on Facebook hoping that other people are raising the talk is, you know, how do you deal with your boys when it comes to dealing with the police? Uh, how do you, you know, how, how have you uh, thought about dealing that to us, ask my friends who had kids of color? And I got some advice, but I also got a lot of people who said, why are you even worrying about raising good Christian black boys? Just raise good Christian boys. Don't worry about the black part. You know, why are you worrying about talking, you know, the talk? I mean, the talk, everyone has a talk, right? Your race doesn't matter. So what was happening was individuals were telling me, look, Ignore race. And the reason why they're telling me that is that's their solution to, to racial issues. And it's not enough that they do it, but everyone must do it. Because if you do not implement it, the solution, we can't reach utopia. The human solution, the solution we figured out in our human depravity. So you can see this is different from human depravity. Human depravity, are, humans are inherently selfish. That cannot be taken away with education. That reminds me of a study that a friend of mine did that looked at education and racial attitudes and racial actions. Because we know that the more education people have, the less racist they are. And so they looked at surveys, and sure enough, the more education people have among whites, the more willing they are to have their kids go to integrated schools. The more education they have, the more willing they are to live in integrated neighborhoods. And then they looked at where people actually, people actually sit their schools and where they lived. They found out with education, controlling for all factors, so this is not an income effect. The education, the more education whites have, the less likely they are to send their kids to, to integrated schools, less likely they are to live in integrated neighborhoods. And the conclusion was, well, maybe this is my conclusion, that education may not make you less racist. Education may give you more of a knowledge of how to hide your sin. Human right does not go away with education. One by account for our desire to protect our own interests of our group. So I come up here speaking to you as an African American man. I'm not going to pretend that that does not impact how I look at racial issues. A solution I'm going to give is going to take into consideration the fact that I am an African American man. But don't fool yourself thinking that, well, I'm objective because you're not. We take that into consideration to deal with our group conflict. 
or we're holding each other accountable, can we find solutions to racial alienation? So here's the key. If we take human depravity seriously, we must learn how to listen to others and get beyond ourselves. If we think that we can figure it out, we can figure it out on our own, for our, or, or, or people in our group can figure it out, and then they inform everyone else the answer, then we are in the grits of human depravity and we're not appreciating it as Christians. As Christians, we need to do better. That's what they're doing out there. We do that out there. If we do what they're doing out there, why should they come to us? What do we have to offer? They're going to do it better. You know, you want to do colorblindness? They're going to do it better out there than they're gonna, we're going to do it in here. They're going to they're go more extreme out there than here. We're going to do anti-racism? They're going to do more extreme out there than in here. So, if we're going to be serious, we're going to take a big world approach. Uh, you know, what I call mutual accountability approach, a Christian-based approach where we recognize all people, all races of a sin nature to be accounted for. This everyone has to work towards healthy interracial communication to solve racial problems. So let me clarify something in the last few minutes. Everybody, regardless of race, has a responsibility to enter into the conversation. Enter the conversation in a way where we hear people out and we try to figure things out. That's everybody. That does not mean the solution is going to be egalitarian at the very end. It may be, it may not be. We've had centuries of racial abuse. So there's probably going to be sometimes the solution is going to be something that seems like whites are paying more right now. That does not mean that whites don't have a say in it, the solution. But just understand, the solution may not be, because if we're imposing a colorblind solution, then we're not listening. All right, so we all have the responsibility. I, I do not let anyone off that responsibility of, of engaging in an honest conversation. Uh, okay, real quick, I have one minute, so that, here's the empirical research supporting my conclusion. Like I said, I do science and, and I, I, you know, I do Christianity. Uh, interracial contact uh, can help alleviate bias. Common group identity is very important to increase positive feelings. Perspective taking, in other words, taking the perspective of other people has been shown to be effective in long-term change of behaviors, clap conversation, what I'm talking about, and skill development. You know, one of the things we, we have to do for this is develop new skills we, we've not developed, such as how to engage in active listening, how to be effective communication. Because if I communicate to you in a way where you can't hear me, Science shows that you really, you literally cannot hear me and that you will not be able to take in information. And so you, you can be right. You know this, right? If you've ever been in a relationship, you know this. You can be right and say it the wrong way and it doesn't matter. Okay? <clears throat> we need to develop these skills. This is not, this, you know, I'm not giving you a solution to just go out and do it. It's something that we've got to work on. So with that, Father, I just thank you for this time, this opportunity. Uh, bring me to this beautiful campus, even on this cold, crisp day. And I pray these words can resonate, and I pray that uh, people can think about how they can uh, bring about some of the change we have, and that we can show a Christian way, something they can't, they're not doing outside this, this campus and in our churches, and, and that we, that the Christian church can be known as a place where people can talk honestly about racial issues. Christ, I do pray. Amen.